very nice to be here. Um, you're probably wondering how I got from Missouri to here. Um, your state court, drug court coordinator um, is originally from Missouri. Oh, Actually, yeah. he was the coordinator in um, St. Louis City, and we're just a couple counties east of there. So that's how I got here. And for this particular presentation, um, I'm doing a presentation later on our four quadrant model. And the person who was originally supposed to do this um, couldn't, so um, I got thrown into this also. But uh, as part of developing our four quadrant drug court model, we've also had to look at um, MAT. So that is why I'm here. Um, in our court, uh, we have um, three counties. And when I came out here, um, I was trying to find a county that was similar in size. And I knew Montana was bigger. Um, but most of your counties are bigger than our three counties put together, but we still kind of have some things in common. We have transportation issues, getting um, people to receive medication-assisted treatment, and um, finding providers. So hopefully some of the things that we learned um, can be transferable to your courts. We have about 45 um, drug court participants in Franklin County, and then we have about 15 in Osage and Gascon Lake County. Franklin County is closer to St. Louis City, and that's our main heroin supplier. So um, we have more medication-assisted treatment going on in that county than we do in the other smaller counties. So today I'm going to share with you some of the obstacles that we encountered, um, the who, what, and when. Um, my background is in criminal justice and the courts. I'm not, uh, was not that familiar with uh, the medical process, and so it was a lot more complicated than I realized it would be. And then also some of the lessons learned. So some of the obstacles that we encountered, um, first of all, was uh, team member buy-in, just put transportation, a lack of local providers, and funding. So first we had to get all the team members on the same page. Um, not just um, the judge and myself, but in particularly our treatment counselors who were in recovery. Um, there was some resistance. Um, there was something about allowing addict to go on some additional medication that they, um, maybe um, how they had, when they had gone through the process or being in recovery, they didn't necessarily agree with putting someone back on um, more medication. So we went to a lot of state conferences. We had team meetings to discuss what we learned when we were at the state conferences. And then we actually had an in-house training. When we found a provider, um, actually they're in St. Louis City, but we were able to set up a, a telemed uh, conferencing system with them. That person came in and actually presented to our whole team, not only our Franklin County team, but also our teams in Osage and Gasconade County. Uh, we invited lo the local defense bar, a lot of the attorneys there, to educate them about the process. We invited um, probation and parole supervisors and actually some of the other probation officers and the non-treatment court probation officers. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is when you start talking about medication-assisted treatment, the more people in the community that you can get involved in it and understanding um, the process, probably the more successful um, you're going to be. All of this didn't happen overnight. This was a, a progression. Um, we really, I guess, had our um, medication-assisted treatment protocol in place for now about a year, um, but it was like probably even two years prior to that that we really started looking at this. And I would go to um, state conferences or training, and it wasn't until we started um, really going, okay, we're going to set this up, that I really became engaged with it. And, and when a speaker was talking, I would be like, okay, how are we going to set this up? And how are we going to do this? So um, I would encourage all of you and to encourage your team members to gather as much information as possible um, so that everyone's comfortable with it. The second obstacle we ran into um, was participant transportation. Even though our counties are much smaller than yours, um, they don't have reliable transportation to get where they need to go, and we have no public transportation. There is a taxi service in one of our towns, um, but, but that's it, and, and that would be cost prohibitive to get our people where they need to go. 
A uh, second issue with this is where most of our providers would have been located in St. Louis City is also where our heroin comes from. So we didn't necessarily want our people driving down to St. Louis City to go to their um, MAT appointment and maybe making an accidental wrong turn and you know getting back into the old neighborhood or it, it just it, it would be a trigger for them. So we had to deal with okay, okay we can't get people there physically. Um, how are we going to? set this up. So not only um, we didn't want to go into St. Louis City where the providers are, we didn't have any in our counties. Um, they're real, we um, talked to some of the local doctors and they just weren't real comfortable with the process. So that is when we turned to setting up telemedicine and it's turned out to be like uh, tremendously successful. Uh, our treatment provider sets up a Tuesday, she has the doctor's undivided attention, and she just schedules um, our participants throughout the day. Um, sits in the office in Union, and the doctor's in St. Louis, and he can do everything that he needs to do um, via a, a secure web cam. Um, and finally, um, how to pay for services. We are very fortunate right now that we have a grant um, that is paying for um, the, the doctor time, the lab work, the nurses, um, the medication. And we're working on right now some additional grant funding and our treatment provider um, is actually um, getting certified in some other areas. So we may be able to tap into some funds there. Missouri has not adopted Medicaid expansion, so that really isn't an option for our court. So we're still working on the funding aspect of it. In Franklin County, uh, we have about nine or 10 participants that are actually on medication-assisted treatment, and that ranges from Suboxone to Vivitrol. And our average bill per month, and that, that includes nurse, doctor, medication, is anywhere from thirteen to $20,000, and that's only for nine people. So as you can see, it's not gonna be something um, easily solved, but hopefully we'll be able to on some more funding sources. So when we started this, um, as I told you before, my background is in medicine, it's criminal justice, courts, and um, this was a lot more complicated process than I thought because when we got this grant funds, they were like, oh, set up your medication assisted treatment. And so um, with the help of our treatment counselor, um, we were able to get this all set up. These are all the players you need. I thought you needed doc just a doctor. Well, that, that wasn't the case. So you have to have your participant who's willing to do this. And um, our counselor, anyone who comes into the program, they're screened um, for their appropriateness for medication-assisted treatment. So the counselor does that screening, and the participant has to be willing. We don't force anyone to do, to do that if they don't want to. Next, you're gonna, obviously, you're going to need a doctor. I knew about that part. Um, the doctor is the one who, whether in person or via our telemed, um, assesses the person and decides if medication assistance or treatment is appropriate for them. Because we use telemed, we also have to have a nurse on site in our treatment provider's office, and that was much easier to find a nurse to be there than a doctor. So the counselor and the nurse sit in on the telemed sessions with the participant as the doctor is speaking with them. And then the nurse, it's up to her to carry out the, the doctor's orders, whether that be for a lab test, which also I had no idea that you would need, um, to check liver enzyme levels if they're going to be placed on Vivitrol to make sure that that's all right. And the doctor probably can speak to this better later. Um, so you, you have to have the nurse there to draw the blood. Um, you might have to have the nurse there to get the Vivitrol injection. And you also have to have a pharmacy who, who they can call the prescription into. So um, as you can see, there's, there's more than just having a doctor and a treatment provider. You need to make sure you have all these in place. And this took us, oh, this probably took us six months to get all this set up, to contract with the nurse. Um, we then had an issue if um, one of our participants is in custody. That nurse wasn't certified to go into the jail, so we actually had to talk to the nurse that the jail already contracted with because she had all the clearance and so she has agreed to do that for us. So there's just a lot of pieces in place. This is how we went about setting it up in Franklin County and our two smaller counties. Um, I work with a treatment provider who um, I think I described earlier as being um, 
they're a little bit more corporate. They're, they're not um, a mom and pop shop that we have there. So you would think maybe the process would be easier setting it up with, with a, a larger agency. However, it hasn't been. Um, they don't necessarily want to use some of these funding pots for this. Um, and so they, uh, um, I'm still working with them. <laughs> Our Franklin County one's ran pretty good, but the other one, um, I, it just, it takes a lot of, um, you got to stick with it and you, um, you, a lot of communication and I don't like to throw the judge card a lot, but sometimes it'd be like, well, the judge wants to know where we're at. So um, sometimes in order to make things work, that's what you have to do. So this form um, is one that actually another treatment agency in our state use. So steal from what, whoever is, has, has a process in place, I guess I'm telling you, um, because when we started out, they sent me this form, um, and we've kind of modified it since then, but this is what the counselor would actually sit down um, and talk to the participant about. Um, so this is kind of a, a flow chart of where we go. You do the intake and assessment um, with the counselor, between the counselor and the participant, then um, she, um, if they believe it may be appropriate for the M for MAT, then she actually goes to that screening instrument. Then um, we'll set up an appointment with the doctor. And um, how our treatment provider in Franklin County has done it, basically Tuesday is MAT day. So she schedules everyone throughout the day, and then the doctor's there, and we have his, un his or her undivided attention. Um, sometimes it's a psychiatrist, sometimes it's a medical doctor just depending on the um, participants' needs. The doctor will then um, order scripts or whatever, uh, lab work, whatever needs to be done. Um, the nurse will administer it or carry out his orders. And then finally, um, actually every week or as needed, the doctor checks back in with the participant. It's just not a one-time meeting with the doctor. There are multiple meetings um, as, as the doctor and, and treatment counselor see fit. Um, this is in Frank, again, this is in Franklin County, um, more complicated in Osage and Gascony. So finally, um, some of the lessons that I've learned through this process is edu educate yourself on medication-assisted treatment. Um, I know in the last couple weeks, um, I uh, watched a couple different webinars um, on medication assisted treatment. Every time I, I do, I learn something new. Um, talk to um, other treatment providers. Um, there's lots of information on um, NADCP's website. Just learn as much as you can about medication assisted treatment. And finally, it'll start making a little bit more sense. You need to make sure you create partnerships. So, um, Assistant Recovery Centers of America, they're actually based in St. Louis City, and that's who we ended up being able to use, to set up a process with for our telemed. Um, and they're the, actually the ones that came out and gave, um, gave the team training. So, um, look around, maybe in some of the bigger jurisdictions, there, there may be someone who would be willing to set that up with you. Alchemies, um, they're actually the company that produces Vivitrol. They came out and did a team training, um, and it wasn't just about Vivitrol. They also talked about Suboxone, um, again, brain chemistry. And so the more times you hear it, the more team members you can get there, um, the better, the more smoothly the process will go. Kind of an unusual partner was the Department of Corrections in the state of Missouri. Um, in Missouri, there's a provision that you can keep someone on probation, but as part of that probation, you can send them for 120 days in the Department of Corrections, so your judge retain, retains jurisdiction. So basically, it's just like they're on probation, but they're just going to have a stay um, in prison. And so we were sending some people there, and, and one day I thought, well, this we're not talking to their treatment institutional treatment counselors. We know they need medication-assisted treatment, so our state courts administrator's office was able to get me in contact with um, actually the director of institutional treatment. And since that time, we've, we've now developed a working relationship. If we send, if someone's been in our program for a while, 
and we send them to the Department of Corrections. Their treatment records go to their treatment counselor, which hadn't been happening. We also usually set up two um, video conferences with them where the institutional um, treatment counselor sits down with the um, defendant and then our treat treatment provider to just say, how are you doing? And then before they're released, um, they, we have another one going, hey, you're coming back, we're excited for you. We, it, it makes it um, the transition a little bit easier. As part of this though, our Department of Corrections had a grant for Vivitrol. And so anyone who goes in now, they're screened for medication assisted treatment. And then if they're screened in there, all the lab work, the initial doctor visit, and the medication is paid for out of a different funding pot. So this has been uh, a surprise to us that um, this has worked. And um, finally, teamwork. Everyone on your team um, has to buy in. Now, um, some, some of our team members are still a little bit resistant, um, but outwardly, at least to the participants, everyone needs to be um, on the same page. And I think, um, for the most part, the more we all educate ourselves about this and the more we learn, um, it, it gets, gets a little bit easier. So that um, is really all I have. Oh, here's, here's our little circuit right here. Um, and uh, St. Louis City is there. So that's where, like I said, most of our heroin comes from. So we try to keep our people away from there. So does anyone have any questions? Good. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, medication-assisted treatment from a different standpoint, from the doctor's standpoint. So um, I apologize if I speak a language which is different than yours, and if what I say kind of bears only tangentially on the courts, bear with me. When Jeff Kushner called me last week and said, hey, can you give a talk on medication-assisted treatment? I think my, my first emotion was bewilderment. Like, what do I have that I could possibly say to y'all to teach you about medication-assisted treatment, um, since you, you live with this epidemic every day? And Jeff said, no, oh, no, this is your perfect, this is your generalist, and um, just tell some patient stories, it'll be fine. So I hope it becomes clear as we go through that I do enjoy medication-assisted treatment. There's a lot of caveats to that statement, but um, my perspective is just as a generalist. And, my second emotion was fear, um, I think, because this is a controversial topic, and if you Google medication-assisted treatment online, you will get endless strings of people uh, uh, debating, uh, to put it politely, uh, whether it is a good thing and uh, which of these medication options is preferred. So you'll find people who say medication-assisted treatment saves my life, and you'll find people who say medication-assisted treatment is the work of the devil, and the only way to beat this addiction is to do it on your own without medications. And I, so I'm going to come at it from the medication-assisted treatment side of things and be gentle with me if you disagree. <laughs> but I'm willing to hear the options of the other sides. 
So again, so my background then, I am a general internal medicine doc. I, I practice in Bozeman, so 140 miles west of here. I've been in Bozeman for about 20 years. And um, most of what I do is general adult medical care. So in the old days before um, we had as many specialists, that meant a lot of like intensive care unit stuff and taking care of heart attacks and things like that. In the last 15 years, the general medicine doctor's role has changed to be kind of more of a um, routine healthcare guy. Like, I, have you had your colonoscopy? Check. Have you had your vaccines? Check. And to kind of bear witness to people as they go through illnesses which are largely managed by specialists now. But the big point of this is that I'm not an addiction medicine specialist. I'm a general internal medicine doc. Most of what I do, the vast majority of what I do, is taking care of diabetes and giving out cholesterol medicines and talking with people about you know, how to stop smoking and things like that. I've been doing medication-assisted treatment now for about the last seven years, and I really enjoy it. I have 100 patients, but still, I, I kind of approach this as like as the newcomer to the field. It's not, it's not my thing. The truth is, my nurses would say it has become my thing because I've spent so much time doing it now. So, so let's talk about. Actually, before I go, uh, talk about that, I mean, the way I got into this was, as with so many things, um, because of one relationship. I have a patient who's the daughter of a friend of mine who came to me about seven years ago now and said, um, look, I'm addicted to OxyContin. I've been taking 80 milligrams three times a day, getting it on the street. It has ruined my life. You know, I, I can't afford it. I'm broke. I can't go to work because half the time I'm withdrawing. And when I'm not withdrawing, I'm searching for OxyContin and seeing how I can wheedle it from friends. And I can't do this anymore. So she said, can you help? And I said, well, I guess. I, I don't know much about Suboxone, but I think that would be the best option for you. Um, again, this is 2009. Um, and so I did the training, which we'll talk about in, in a second, uh, to prescribe it. And I would say that my experience with watching her go from being this, um, at the end of her rope, 30-year-old um, woman to being a wife, mother, productive member of society um, has been transformational for me. And I, so that's, uh, that experience with her is why I've become a fan of So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pharmacology. And I, I apologize if this is all obvious, but sometimes it is good, as Beth said, to, to go over the things that, that are obvious so we're all on the same page. So there are three options for medication-assisted treatment in America, methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine. Um, Methadone and buprenorphine are agonists, meaning that if this is the opioid receptor, they bind tightly to that receptor. Now, trexone is an antagonist, meaning it blocks the receptor. So, uh, the agonist therapy has two advantages. If you have methadone or buprenorphine bound to your mu, uh, mu receptor, the opioid receptor, it means that nothing else can bind to it. So, you inject heroin or take oxycontin doesn't give you the high because the buprenorphine or methadone are bound there. The other advantage to them is that those receptors are not empty. and It's that those naked empty receptors which make people feel horrible, make them have withdrawal, make them have craving. So methadone and buprenorphine are both good at treating that. Um, now Trexone blocks the receptors, so um, uh, keeps you from getting the high from heroin, may not be as good at preventing the, the craving as the other. So uh, methadone and naltrexone have a couple of disadvantages. I'm going to talk a little bit about those for a second. So, so methadone has been the gold standard treatment for 60 years now. You know, we've been using it since the 50s. Um, it works. It's a, uh, it's a good medication. The disadvantages to it uh, are largely they can only be legally administered in a federally licensed opioid treatment center. And in case you don't know, there's only four of those in Montana. I think that's still correct. Um, Billings, Bozeman, Kalispell, and Missoula. In fact, the one in Bozeman just opened like a month ago. Is that Belgrade? Is Belgrade. it in Belgrade? Yeah, Belgrade. Belgrade. Yeah, so, sorry, I should. That's, that's okay. It's something it's that Belgrade, that's, that's a typical Bozeman thing to say, like pretending like Belgrade is part of Bozeman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but so if you don't live in one of those sites, you're kind of out of luck. Um, people do drive to them. But the other big disadvantage is that you have to do it every day. At least initially, you go there every single day, you get your your dose of methadone for the day, the one in Belgrade closes at 11 a.m. on Eastern medication. So it, it's hard to have a normal life if every single day you have to go there at a certain time get your medication. And if you want to go on about your life and not be reminded 
every single day that you are an opioid addict. This, this is a difficult uh, option. Now, Trexone is a great medication. I think there's going to be other talks about it. I have no, no experience prescribing it, except I, I have a few patients I've prescribed it to for alcohol abuse, which it could also be used for. Um, the, the big problem with it for me is that most of my patients are already on Suboxone, and I mention this as, as an option to everybody, but step number one, if you're switching from Suboxone to now Trexone, is to get off the Suboxone, and that's kind of a non-starter for a lot of people. Like They're like, you, you tell me I have to get off this medication and be off it for a week before I can start it? No, thank you. So I'm still looking for the first patient I'm going to prescribe that to for opioid use disorder. The other disadvantage is it's very expensive. Um, when it's given in the, in the only good form, which is the injectable form, which is Vivitrol. Um, the pill form is a lot cheaper, but the pill form that has the disadvantage that you can stop taking it at any time. I have a patient in my practice now who was cared for by another doctor, got out of inpatient treatment, was on the world, and Altrexone was doing wonderful, and then she just decided to schedule a relapse by stopping the Altrexone. So it didn't really help her in that one. Okay, so what I, what I have the most experience with is buprenorphine. Um, so as you probably know, since 2006, we've been able to prescribe buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. And it can be prescribed by anybody who's gone through a, um, a little bit of extra training, and I'll come back to that. The uh, other advantage of naltrexone is anybody can prescribe it. You don't have to have any extra training, so it's very attractive uh, for that reason. And there's no limits. I can, I'm limited in how many people I can prescribe buprenorphine to. I can prescribe every patient in my practice with, uh, with naltrexone if I want to. So some terminology, so when buprenorphine is combined with naloxone, uh, it's sold under the brand name Suboxone. There's several other options out there now, but still we all call it Suboxone because that's the one that first came out. And when it's prescribed by itself, it's called Subutex. I don't even know if you can get Subutex brand name anymore, but it's still called Subutex. So those are the options. So, and this is probably, probably an obvious statement, but this is medication-assisted treatment, so all of those should be part of some type of bigger picture treatment involving counseling and social services, even though that's kind of hard to do in practice. So um, what I'd like to do is, is share some patient stories with you, kind of get a sense of what it's like to prescribe this, because you probably see it from a different, I mean, you, you definitely see it from a different side of things. So what's it like from the medical side of things? But first, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between Suboxone and Subutex, because this is kind of, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about this. So in practice, these are really the same medication. When you take them sublingually, which is the way you're supposed to take them, the naloxone, the, the antagonist part of suboxone, really is not absorbed. A little bit's absorbed, but it's not absorbed in the big whoosh that makes naloxone so effective when you give it in a shot form. So naloxone, I should say, that that's the same thing as Narcan. It's the medicine that we are giving opioid users to use intranasally or via injection to reverse an overdose. But when you take that same medicine by mouth, you don't get any rush from it. It doesn't, doesn't reverse anything. It's useless. The only reason why they put that in there is because opioid users will inject things. And um, if you give them Subutex, they will melt it and inject it, or they can melt it and inject it, inject it. And if you mix the antagonist in there, if they try and do that, it does not work as well. So. It may produce no effect, it may produce unpleasant effects, it may even precipitate withdrawal. And for that reason, the party line is that we prefer to use Suboxone for treatment for patients with opioid use disorder. The reality is, if, if you get online, I did this last night, and just Google injecting Suboxone, you will find endless lists of patients describing how they do it. And the consensus seems to be is it's not quite as good as Subutex, and definitely not as good as heroin or oxycodone, but it's better than nothing. And that even though it's got the, the Narcan in it, people do inject it. And that's what my patients tell me as well. So don't, I, I don't think we can fool ourselves that Suboxone is not injectable because it is. So pragmatically, one problem with Suboxone is it costs twice as much as Subutex. So in Bozeman, the last I checked, it was about 8 to 10 bucks for 8 milligrams of Suboxone and 4 to 5 bucks for Subutex. And for people are taking three of these a day, so it's 30 bucks versus 15 which for, for a lot of my patients is a big, a big factor. So one thing I have to battle with myself is my tendency is to prescribe Subutex even though I worry that it may not be quite as safe for my patients. I have a question. Do you usually yeah. prescribe more of the strips or the oral? 
I don't think it makes a difference. The world is a little bit cheaper. Patients dislike the world, the taste of it a lot. It's got this horrible sticky consistency that takes a long time to dissolve. And, um, that's my patient's biggest complaint about it. Um, but they're both meltable. Um, uh, so the other pragmatic thing is Subutex has a higher street value, and, and diversion is actually my biggest worry with all of this. These, neither one of these drugs, I should say, are much of a drug of abuse. Uh, even injecting it, you don't get a dramatic high from it. There's not a lot of um, uh, reason for patients to take higher and higher doses of it because they don't get much more of a bang for the buck once you get above two pills a day. Um, but Subutex has a higher street value, and um, for that reason, um, I, I worry about my patients who are taking it selling it on the street. And that may be why Medicaid covers only Suboxone. Um, and in pregnancy, uh, we can only prescribe Subutex. So I, I've had a fair number of pregnant patients in the last few years, and we have to give them Subutex. Yes? So, I mean, I'm, I have patients that do, you know, they are diverting it, and they say they get high off of mm -hmm. it. So if it doesn't get them that high, why yeah. are they doing that? Just to get so, a little bit? Diverting it, you mean selling it to other people? Or, or, take, or they're taking a lot of it, or they're getting it. Getting, taking extra doses. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would say my patients often run out a day or early, so they get a little bit more to prescribe. But I, I don't see patients, my, my patients, I'm not saying uh, overall, using a lot extra. Um, I have other people that aren't on it that, that, that take get it. it, that buy it, that take it. So my experience with my patients from when they first come to me that they've, before they started, you know, uh, in prescription form, say that they, they take it usually when they can't get anything. So it's not like it's people don't go out there and beat the bushes trying to find some because they it's want like it. Just like a, right. It's like I can't get my oxy, I'll take subutex. If that's all you got, I'll take it. Okay, so my first case study is a patient uh, named LC. I'm gonna go ahead and call her Lindsay because it's hard for me to say LC. I met Lindsay three years ago. And she uh, really taught me a lot about subutex, suboxone, and their limitations. So um, a lot of these uh, long narratives are actually I copied them out of my notes from when I saw her. Um, I'll tell a little bit more about why I met her, but actually was referred by a Billings heart surgeon uh, in December. So most of my visits with these patients is not about medical stuff, it's about their social history. Where are they, who's, who are they living with, who are their supports, what are their jobs like, you know, all that kind of thing. So hers is kind of typical of my, my patients. Uh, mother left her for the fourth, third or fourth time when she was 11. She got through high school by staying with some friends. Went, went to some college, but kind of did it on her own. She started using opioids when she was in high school, and I would say that's the vast majority of my patients started when they were teenagers. Um, I knew it was wrong, but it made me feel better. So she got pregnant first when she was 20. She's had two pregnancies. She did stop during her pregnancies, but then she started right after the birth of her last daughter eight months ago. Um, a few months before I first met her, she started feeling bad, and she stopped using intravenous drugs altogether, and she started getting Suboxone, actually it's probably Subutex, on the street. And she came to me because she wants to go back on it. During this hospital stay in Billings, they put her on methadone. Of course, I can't prescribe methadone legally. So we had to switch her to something different, and Subutex was what we chose. I, I believe her first visit, she came in with her eight-month-old eight daughter. Um, both of her daughters are in daycare during the day. She told me she really wanted to be absent because she knew she'd die if she used again. She worked in the kitchen at a local hotel. She had a boss who was actually supportive of her. Her mother uh, was not a very positive influence in her life, kept calling her a junkie bitch. And she has a brother, but he's not really part of her life either. So this is a woman who, when I first met her, I was uh, impressed by her um, strength and resiliency and what kind of vulnerability. She was kind of like a child, but, but a child who'd been through a lot and was dedicated to raising her two kids. And she learned through life, ain't nobody gonna help her with herself. So I met her because she had developed infective endocarditis. She had um, uh, again, been sick for several months, went to the hospital in Bozeman, blood cultures were drawn, the next day they grew strep viridans, a, a skin bacteria that is common with injection drug users, um, to get in their system. Um, she had an echocardiogram which showed a clump of bacteria on her aortic heart valve, and she came to Billings to have her valve replaced. So 22 years old, she's having a valve replacement. That was done here at St. Vincent's using this minimally invasive technique. Um, and then she met me right after she left the hospital. Um, the next month was kind of a stormy one for her. Uh, as is common after heart surgery, she had a bunch of complications. 
Um, she um, had a coral effusion of this bloody collection of fluid around one of her lungs. It had, she had to come back over here and have it drained in the operating room. In January, she got chest pain and was found to have this thing called a pseudoaneurysm at the site of the previous surgery. A big deal. The part of them actually just split her chest. Um, but then after January, things kind of quieted down. Um, and she went on about the life that she had was building for herself. So continued to attend NA meetings, couldn't afford counseling, uh, made too much for Medicaid, but um, so counseling was not uh, mandatory for her. Um, well, she actually she did go to alcohol and drug service, I forgot. Um, said she wasn't using, didn't want to use, and was really part of her um, children's lives in a way that um, impressed me. In early March, so she got sick again, flu-like symptoms, drenching sweats, and eventually we drew blood cultures and found that she had a different bacteria in her blood this time. So I want to emphasize, having bacteria in your blood once and having bowel replacement is bad. Having it twice is really, really bad. Um, she was hospitalized overnight, and it didn't go well. This is what the doctor wrote in the discharge note. The nurse taking care of her was in tears by the morning because of her inappropriate yelling and foul language. This was discussed with Dr. Herring. I'm like, I think she thought I was going to fix that. Um, but this is a common theme with my patients. They, they get into the hospital and they've learned their whole lives that authority figures are um, scary and not to be trusted. And like the hospital is like authority figure central. Like everybody who walks into the room seems to have power over them. And um, so they're scared to death and don't react well and have learned poor coping skills their whole lives. So most of my patients, they get in the hospital, it's not good. And they often don't follow the rules very well. So she's supposed to get six weeks of antibiotics. She gets tired of that and stops after five weeks. Um, but still, she said she was doing, doing well. And this is my favorite quote. Quote, I don't hang out with those people anymore. She changed her life. Um, a lot of stress. One of her fellow employees was, was uh, kind of rude to her a lot. And she was looking forward to her daughter's first birthday party. In early June, so six months after her first uh, endocarditis episode, she gets recurrent symptoms, she's had five weeks of intravenous antibiotics, and yet she's got bacteria in her blood again. You know, we, all of her doctors kind of talked about what she's still using, and I think the conclusion is we, we didn't know, her urine tests were negative, but we worried about it. She seemed to deny that, or she, she denied that. Um, she developed a fiancé, he left her. Um, she lost her last job, she's starting a new one, but overall she's hopeful. She's on good terms with the father of her older child, but otherwise alone. So um, she goes back to Billings, found to have more bacterial goop on her valves. Again, gets pissed off and leaves the hospital. The cardiac surgeons discuss her case and say that the only thing that they can really do to this 20-year-old, 22-year-old, is open her, her chest again. So they call her and get her to come back. She drives herself to Billings, and that image really still gets me. <clears throat> Ooh, she's 22, she has nobody, she drives herself like at 6 in the morning to Billings to have heart surgery. And it's a disaster. The surgery takes 88 hours. <clears throat> they find abscess everywhere. They can't find any living tissue to sew her new heart valve into, and she dies on the table. And <clears throat> the operative note um, still gets me. There's, there's nobody to call to um, notify that she's dead. And I think about you know, her kids growing up without her. And the lesson number one for this is this is a bad, bad disease. So even people who do all the right things, who seem to comply with medication-assisted therapy, it ain't good for them. And I, I could have, you know, you all know the statistics. I could put, you can Google this and, and find a million depressing statistics about how bad the opioid epidemic is. And I know you, you all know that. I just put a few statistics up here. But, um, the bottom line for me is that those statistics don't even tell half of the story. I'm mean, like, those two kids who are never going to know their mom, that really gets to me. It's not just the deaths and the overdoses and the, you know, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we spend trying to save people from this. It's, it's the, everybody whose lives, especially these people's, uh, all their lives get screwed up as well. So MAT may be the answer. It's one of the answers. The, the problem is, though, that there are not very many board-certified medicine, addiction medicine specialists in Montana. There's only 11, so woefully understaffed, I guess I'd say. And so the solution may be more docs like me to prescribe MAT. And this is one of the um, drives of the Obama administration to uh, 
make MAT more accessible by getting more people to prescribe it and by um, uh, letting people who do prescribe it prescribe it to more patients. But it's, it's hard. So there's downsides to people like me that I prescribe this and I have to acknowledge that. The big one is that there's this, this huge learning curve. I, I have no experience in prescribing this. I have no experience as an addiction medicine specialist, and yet I'm out there caring for 100 people who have it. And I think early on, particularly, I was very naive. You know, patients say, you know, Doc, the, um, I can't take Suboxone because I get headaches. I need Subutex. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't, you know, <laughs> here's your prescription. I, I can't come in next month. Okay, come back. You know, so um, I've had to learn a lot about this as I go through. Um, and there's no mentors. You know, uh, we'll come back to this in a second. Nobody else in Bozeman that I work with prescribes this. There's one other doctor in Bozeman who prescribes Suboxone. He doesn't work with me. Um, uh, I have a question. There's yeah. another doctor who's, they do VisionNet now. Through. They do what? Um, it's like VisionNet. I'm, I'm a probation officer. I've had a couple of people that there's, what is it called? The ideal option. Ideal option, yes. So there is a... So there's an, Dr. Olson. Uh, Dr. Wilson and myself are the ones yep. who have been doing it. Ideal Option just opened this year. It's an out-of-state... Yeah. Um, telemedicine. Telemedicine. Uh, if anybody from here is from Ideal Option, talk to me about it. My impression is not overwhelmingly positive. About that's it. what I'm trying to ask. It's a big that. kind of ka operation is my, my feeling. And that's cynical, but true. Um, that's kind of... So um, it's hard to integrate this into a normal practice. Again, my job, my day is filled with filling in prescriptions for other things and seeing people to, for health care maintenance and... Um, it's difficult to integrate. And um, again, it's uh, all these protocols that you've developed with forethought. I, I de we developed these protocols just based on what seemed logical at the time. And it's kind of been on the job training. And I hate to say that, but it's kind of true. I think we've developed protocols which work. And yet, um, I can't pretend, as I said, that they're protocols that um, came from someplace else. They came out of me and my nurses thinking about how to help these people. So here's another case study, and I'll go through this a little bit quicker. So this is a husband and wife team. They're some of my first patients. They came to meet me in October of 2013, just when I was really starting to prescribe it to a lot of people. So he'd been using opioids for seven years, heroin for a year or two. She started using heroin after her first, their first child was born four years ago. So they've kind of been using together. He got in trouble with the law, got placed in the sanctions program at Bozeman, um, spent three weeks in jail. And is forced to live in Bozeman, have a drug monitor, have frequent drug testing, etc. Um, she stopped heroin during her second pregnancy a year ago, and then went back on it because she just couldn't stop, spending up to two hundred days, two hundred dollars a day on it. Um, and the thing which which I think changed her life, she said one day she was, so they actually lived in West Yellowstone. She did. He was in Bozeman because he was in, in jail, but she had to drive to Bozeman to meet her um, supplier. And so one, you know, she's has her two kids, ages four and one, in the back seat. She's driving through the Gallup Canyon while she's withdrawing because she hasn't had her fix for a few days. She gets to Bozeman and her supplier says, I don't have any heroin today, I'm sorry. And she's like, you know, what am I going to do? So she scrambles, makes a whole bunch of phone calls and finds somebody in Livingston. So she's withdrawing, driving through the Bozeman path with, Pass with the kids in the back seat. And uh, she gets her heroin that way. And she, she said, this is crazy. I, I can't do this anymore. I've got to quit. My husband's going to be in trouble. He's going to go to prison if I don't stop. Um, so we've all got to stop. So they both tried Subutex on the street before, and uh, they asked me to prescribe it for them. And I, will, I will never forget the way she looked when I first met her. Um, so she was actually, she knew that she had to be in withdrawal when she started it. She was withdrawing, looked as miserable as any person I've ever seen in my life. He, again, he'd been off it because he had to go through withdrawal in jail. Um, but we, they both started it and got stabilized on a pretty low dose, 12 milligrams or low-ish dose. And since then, it's all been kind of peaches and cream for them. Their tox screens are negative. They've always got buprenorphine in their urine when we test them. They've since then moved to Bozeman and they now live there. He's got a job as a chef at a restaurant downtown. She has two waitressing jobs. Um, they, they talk when we come in. We talk about their kids going to kindergarten and playing t-ball and kind of normal adult stuff. They, on their own, initiated papers, and they both say when they come in, that part of our lives is over. That, that just gets me. So lesson number two is this: that I really do believe this. That I'm not saying that it has to be buprenorphine, but but um, allowing people the time to rethink their lives by putting them on MAT, and so they're not kind of going through withdrawal every single day and kind of going through this cycle of not being able to, to get out of it because they're either miserable or high. Um, 
gives them the space to think about things in a way which allows them to move down the road. And I'm, I'm impressed by these patients as an example. What's the timeline that you look at someone being on, you know, Suboxone? How long do we stay on it? Yeah. Yeah. Because um, that, that's a big thing. We, we read a lot of things that say it shouldn't be for more than a year, or we got others say it should be on for a lifetime. You know, and then what, what type of testing do you do? Because us as treatment courts, we, we run into this all the time, because we, you know, what levels should they be at? What levels should they be at? Yeah. You know? So moving on. Um, no, I, I, it's, I don't know the answer to that question. That's, that's the million dollar question. And I, I'll, I'll show a slide this later on. So most, so even though I'm not an expert on this, I, I you know, go to the Addiction Society of, of America medicine meetings and um, get the journals and read the journals. And most experts suggest maybe not lifelong, but long-term maintenance therapy. And a lot of studies show that people who taper off quickly, like, you know, you can save lives, you're not going through withdrawal, and then you taper over a month or two, those patients have like a, an incredibly high risk of relapse. Like the number 100% is quoted in some of these studies. I don't think it's really that high. It's like 80% or more uh, very high risk of relapse. So my job is to get people on as low a dose as we can and, and then just to wait. And I'll, um, my hope is, is that with time, and I don't know how long that time is, all of that, I call it the lizard brain, that, that has had them in the cycle of you know reward, pleasure, reward, pleasure, seek, reward, pleasure, that that part of their brain shrivels up and that as they get enmeshed in real life, you know, taking care of kids, taking kids to t-ball, taking kids to kindergarten, that um, at some point we can take them and that they're not going to immediately think, you know, dang it, I missed that heroin, that was awesome. I haven't got there with any patients yet. But again, I've, I've really been prescribing this to a lot of patients only for three years. Okay, so the, the big themes on my patients are the are ACEs, adverse childhood events. So you all all know the ACEs study, but um, universal chaos in their lives as children. Parents' absence, parent on drugs, parents who abuse, and parents who just aren't there emotionally or physically. One of my most difficult patients, so I eventually I could not see him anymore because he just kept abusing the system, said it this way, we were screwed from the get-go. And I think that that's true of about half of my patients. Most of them are of lower income, low enough that they um, either are in, on Medicaid or don't quite make Medicaid, but don't have enough to pay for a lot of stuff. Most are from the Gallatin Valley. I do have a fair number of patients from Browning, Helena, and Great Falls because a, a doctor in Helena, in fact, I think the only buprenorphine prescriber in Helena closed his practice and I got all of his patients. Um, about half divided between men and women, most you know, have stable relationships, most have kids, and most are either students or are employed, maybe underemployed. Okay, so the process again, all you need to do to, to prescribe this, and this is one of my messages I hope that you'll spread to others, is you take an eight-hour online course. Um, I did it because I was on call on New Year's Day, the day that this woman had asked me to, to prescribe it. Sat at my computer for eight hours, it's like a working day, and then I could prescribe it. Not too difficult. So the first year, you can prescribe it to 30 patients, after a year, if you want, you can apply it, you can extend it to 100 patients, and that's where I am. As of August, again, the Obama administration says that we can prescribe it to 275 patients if we meet certain criteria. Are those federal standards? Yeah, it's the SAMHSA, this mental, what is, I don't remember what SAMHSA stands for. But anyway, it's, it's a federal agency yeah. okay. it's under the DDA. Okay. So here are the big controversies with Suboxone, and this is the one I hear the most. It's just another addiction, and it's totally true. It's the only medicine I prescribe where I say, here, take this pill. You're going to be addicted to it, and it's a good thing. Um, and that's certainly the, the uh, AA and NA standpoint, that we're substituting something for something else, and that really the people are still addicted, and they haven't really learned to deal with whatever got them there in the first place. And that is totally true. Um, my pragmatic response is yes, uh, my patients are addicted to, to subutex and suboxone, but at least it's one that allows them to lead a somewhat normal life. And that's huge to me. I have so many patients who have failed multiple times before they get to me. They've been in prison, they've failed inpatient treatment twice, and uh, I believe in this because it seems to work. Yeah. I have a lot of clients that have abused suboxone, and then they go to like ideal options. Mm -hmm. or other doctors and get it prescribed. I guess I have a hard time dealing with when I have a client that I know is shooting up Suboxone because they're getting off the streets and they, then they turn right around and get a prescription for it and, well, can't do nothing now about it. Well, so, uh, 
I mean, th that is true. I have to worry every time I write this prescription that they're going to use it inappropriately. But there, there are still some societal benefits, I would argue. That, that if I, they're getting a prescription from, from the pharmacy, they are not involved with the whole It's kind of like we reward them. Okay, yeah, you abused them, but now we're rewarding you because now you can go get it legally. Well, again, I don't, I don't think these people would look at it as a reward. Um, I look at it as a reward. I know they don't look at it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the, the thing what they were doing for the get-go was trying to deal with their addiction in a survival mode. I mean, that's what that's what accessing street drugs is about. Well, it's hard to see them go all the way to treatment court for 18 months and no Suboxone or Subutex, and then they get out of treatment court and go get a prescription see, for the, it. To be the controversy, they go yeah. yeah. to so, so my first patient, I'm kind of kind of that. It's hard for me because this is my first patient actually was one of Bozeman's first treatment court graduates. She'd done inpatient treatment, then she did treatment court. She was like everybody's poster child, and then she goes back on the street and gets oxy. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to look at it like her. Again, so maybe she's abusing the subjects. I don't think so. Or she's on Suboxone. But um, she is not supporting the whole paraphernalia that makes the vast drug machinery go forward. I, think that's I understand it's the lesser of the evils. Harm reduction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I can't, I can't be with my patients. Um, the one advantage of methadone is you see them take it in the methadone clinic, and I, I can't be there to watch them. I guess I could be there to watch them take it, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, if I understand you right, when they are, even if they're abusing these drugs, they're not really getting high, they're going to getting sick. That's Correct. what most of them tell me when they use them sublingually. You can get a little bit of a rush from using an IV, but again, That's what I'm but again so I don't, I'm going to bet that the patients that you've worked with who have abused it do not say, this is my drug of choice. I love shooting up Subutex. I think that no. they say, I use Subutex on a bad day. Yeah. So again, the big uncertainty is how long to continue. And I've got no patients who have been able to get off. I've got some, some who have tapered down to really some, some low doses. Okay, so this is the big question that Beth was hitting. So um, maybe MAT is not the answer to the opioid epidemic, but if it is, we need to have more doctors who prescribe it. And why do people not prescribe it? Again, in Bozeman, it's me and Ken Olson, and now there's a couple of, there's the methadone clinic, which is a great thing, and this ideal option, which may be a great thing, I don't know. Um, but why do people like me not prescribe it? And part of it is, it's just a hassle. I think the big part is this fear of difficult patients. And may, may, maybe all the, uh, uh, see That's this. deal with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, okay. We have the difficult patients. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you'll, I guess you see it not as, as clients and but so I, we have all doctors learn that patients there's certain patients who just suck up an enormous amount of time and energy and at the end of the day they're <coughs> exhausted and some of my subutex patients are in this this category that they you know there's always some drama nothing is ever simple and it's just painful um, to interact with them sometimes and so I think a lot of doctors say I don't even want to get any of those patients in my practice and if that means I don't prescribe box, I'm fine. They fear that it's going to affect the rest of their practice. You know, there are other patients who are not, um, who, who still need care and can't get it because they're being pulled away to care for patients who maybe get what they deserve. And that's definitely the feeling of some of my partners, I think. Another is the lack of support. I'm, I'm always impressed when I hear about people who have systems in place to um, treat social issues and um, to do counseling. We don't have that in, in private practice, um, at least where I am, and um, that lacking that infrastructure is a big problem for me. And again, it's, it's exhausting. But I think the biggest one is this, that um, this treating patients right is the sacred thing. Like, you know, we're there for the patient, and, and yet there's this mistrust that's there from the beginning with my Suboxone patients. Sometimes earned, sometimes not, and it's really weird. And doctors don't like that. They don't want to think that their patients might be lying to them, but it happens. And I think I've gone over time here, so I'm going to just summarize this case really quickly. My last case is a guy who comes to see me. Again, horrible early life. Dad is the craziest, meanest man I ever met. Dad commits suicide. The patient starts using drugs at a young age. Um, He's been through inpatient counseling twice. He's had anger treatment a couple of times. Then he has a kid, and that seems to change his life. And then he starts getting Suboxone on the from another provider, and that seems to change his life. And so he comes to see me because the other provider fires him. He doesn't know why. He just told me I couldn't come anymore. <laughs> um, so, oh, and by the way, Dr. Herring, I have ADD, and I really need this Adderall prescription. The other doctor gave it to me at this big dose. Why can't you? So I, I, he, he becomes my patient for a while. 
he tells me he's getting his urine screened elsewhere through the courts. And you can get those results if you want. We never seem to get them. So finally, after I, he's been my patient probably for six months, I do my urine, first urine tox screen. And it shows this um, incredibly high amount of, of suboxone with a very low amount of the metabolite suboxone, which suggests that he's shaving. Um, so he's, he's in there in the bathroom shaving it or dipping it into his urine sample. Of course, he denies that. Oh my gosh, why would I, what, Dr. Hamming, I need this medicine. Why, why would I do that? Um, you know, then there's, we feel, he, we ask him to come in for a random urine test and he goes to a different lab. I thought you wanted me to go to this other lab. And I'll come in next week, you know. So, so finally, uh, six weeks later, he calls and confesses that at this visit where he had the abnormal urine tox screen, he had thought that I was going to come down on him for drinking alcohol. And there's always a story, which I don't care if he drinks alcohol. Um, and so therefore he brought in a f sample of someone else's urine, and then he knew that there wouldn't be suboxone in it, so he dipped the other person's urine with suboxone. So it's a kind of crazy story. So anyway, I uh, terminated my relationship with him at that point. But this is the hardest thing <laughs> for me. I, I do lie. But people lie, and I, and I don't, I'm like naive, you know, just a kid from Bozeman. I don't, I don't know how to deal with liars. They don't teach you that. I'm not a detective, you know. So half the time, my nurses and I are in this like exhausting. Is he lying to us? You know, how do we know? When was his lying? And I just hate that. I'm when a you, doctor, damn it, you know. I have a question. When you interview, would you ever ask him? Are you on supervision or anything? Like, kind of like that way, you kind of know if they're on supervision. Like, someone will come in, like, you know, just kind of general questions you ask about, like, their life. What's going on in their life? Do you ever ask them if they're on supervision, kind of thing? That way, you kind of maybe know, like, they're on probation. Like mean, probation. Oh well, yes. Yeah, so they talk. We talk about probation all the time. Okay. So I just kind of ask about their problems with the law. Yes. And I would say, I would say universally, my patients find their probation officers really supportive, um, which was I, and y'all probably all know that, but as someone the, who's not in the judicial field, I thought that they'd be like, man, my PO is like all over me, and they're like. My PO gets me and you know, helps me out. So. Okay, so the, the way we find liars, urine tox screens, we do pill counts, which is unbelievably hard to do in practice. Um, and then we, we look for red flags. So early refills, missed appointments, um, preference for subutex, again, the one that's got the higher street value over suboxone, and then the dog ate my prescription stories. My favorite is I have a patient who, he called like two weeks early for a prescription refill, and the reason was because he went to swim in the Madison and he took his pills with him in the, the uh, pocket of his swimming suit. And then he went swimming in the Madison, and the pills all got wet. <laughs> and I wasn't sure whether to say, you can do better than that, or to say, maybe this is bad decision making is something that got you here. Okay, I want to go through the, I'm gone over, so I'll, I'll stop there. But the big uncertainties for me are when to taper. Do you taper off? Do you taper just to a low level? Do you give Subutex the cheap one versus Suboxone, the expensive one that's safer probably? Where does Vivitrol fit into the picture? I'm still, I ask every patient about it now, and I can't prescribe to any more Suboxone patients. I'm at my, my max, so I, I'm really looking for something that I can give Vivitrol to, and I hope it works. The biggest one for me is what do you do if counseling is not affordable, and it's not for a lot of my patients. Medicaid pays for counseling, which is awesome, but uh, for patients who are kind of underinsured, it's really difficult to you know, pay 150 bucks an hour to talk to somebody. Um, is NA helpful or is NA a place where go, people go to find drugs? And the biggest one for me, the, the thing that I find in urine tox screens again and again, patients who are doing well, have not used heroin in years, can't stop using meth. And I, you know, you look up meth, treat, treatment of meth addiction, and the articles on that are very short, and they basically say, we don't know how to treat meth addiction. And that's, I know it's an oversimplification, but um, how, to, how to medically treat meth addiction. I don't think know the ideal option, actually, they, they should have, like, I think it's called Doxa or something, which is just basically a legalized, you know, medical formula. Oh, so they get rid of Okay. It's basically a, you know, it's just amphetamine. So there's an antidepressant called Remeron, which I've started a few patients on mm -hmm. for it, and it's too early to tell whether it helps, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, sorry, I talked a little too much. Um, any questions about... MAT or any comments? So those of you who are not MAT fans, tell me, tell me what I should worry about. And tell me why I'm too naive. I have a question. Yeah. We, we don't have a provider, and if I were to go to a doctor, what is my best approach? What would what would you? Because you want suboxone. Yeah. If we so, if we want to talk to 
somebody to get on board with this? <laughs> I mean, what would you? So you they're you busy. Have, Doctors are busy. You know that. Well, so you <laughs> have to find a doctor who, who is not adding a woman and is willing to prescribe. Actually, interestingly, studies show that most doctors who have the, the um, DEA certificate to prescribe to box some prescribe to just an incredibly small number of patients, and I don't really know why that is. But, um, so the first thing is to find a doctor to prescribe, and you call the office and say, are you taking your patients? We don't have one. That's what I'm saying. If I could approach it, have you're asking to. Oh, for the court. court. Oh, right. for right. you as a patient. Right. Recruit. Right. So yeah, recruiting doctors. Right. How would I recruit a doctor? That's what I'm... Oh, you mean to get the, to, get the, to do the eight hours of yeah. the certificate? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, uh, so I actually, I was telling Beth before, I, I actually stood up in front of our medical staff uh, a, a month ago and said, hey, I prescribed Suboxone, the Obama administration just came out with this big announcement that they want more people to prescribe, it's a good thing, we've got this opioid epidemic. One thing I didn't mention is that we have the opioid epidemic in part because of people like me prescribing too many uh, opioids, and that's why they're so out there on the street in part. Um, and I could talk for that about that for an hour. but. Um, no one else in the medical staff expressed any interest in prescribing for those, those reasons. So I, I guess I didn't answer your question. I, I don't know. Talk with doctors that you have. Okay. I think probably a lot of education. Are there, are there, are there, are there, are there some, some studies being established and some training about, about tapers? I, I, just, I can't imagine at this point that there, there wouldn't be some sort of Oh, yeah, so protocols or, or developing protocols. So I, I can taper people. So yeah, I, I'm right. comfortable doing that. The question is, when are yeah, they right? right? Well, I mean, studies to say because there's different classes of, of clients. Because you've been probably get you know, like a lot of people are are lower income, and partly because of the result of their of their drug use. But there, there's also kind of a middle class phenomenon. I think of opiate. Yeah. You know, abuse or addction that, that you know, would, it's a little, a little different. So I think everybody is, is um, different, and so I, I bring it up at every patient client's yeah. visit. And I, and I guess my simple minded approach is if the patient says that I'm not ready, I'm yeah. reluctant to push yeah. them. I have, a, um, I have a couple of people that um, I've actually talked to your office, and I think that, you know, I when I've had concerns, I've address in your office, which has been great. You guys have been really working with me. So it's nice. I just kind of like to know like the different offices. But, but I can't, you know, again, I, I don't have the infrastructure. And so there are times when we'll look down and say, oh my gosh, we haven't seen this patient in 10 months. So people can fall through the cracks. Um, I don't know what I was going to say. For people that, because I, I think, you know, the, 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 the evidence does support that counseling and medication is, is the best treatment. And for people who don't have any, I mean, alcohol drugs, we, we, where I work full time, I do some private stuff that I've worked with you on, but I, um, we have a science scale. There's, there's nobody that gets turned away because of inability to pay there. In fact, that's where, so just so you know that. Because when we had called and we got the, the there's still, so, so the, the bottom of the sliding scale is zero? Or it's just, um, well, it's very little. I mean, because they, they, they have now, now with the Medicaid, and Medicaid expansion, a lot more people are covered. But if people are making too much for that, but not making tons, there's, you know, it's, and our, and our rates are, are much, we don't charge $150 an hour like, like in the private sector. So yeah, on my sheet of patients of uh, um, referrals, you are at the top. Okay, so. well, just, just so you know that there's, if they're telling people, I can't afford it, yeah, it's pretty affordable. Okay, I will. Is there a doctor in Livingston that does it too? Yes, Dr. Swarney, actually, it does. Bruce Swarney? Yeah, I had a guy in treatment court that was going over to Livingston and getting stuff. Mm -hmm. There's, There's a Dr. Kurtz, um, who still, I think, is practicing, also does it. Yes. So I have a question. Yes. Yeah. When you go through the training, do they talk about the importance of the, the treatment component of it with the MAT? Because I know particularly what I've learned right. with Vivitrol, it, getting Vivitrol, you don't have the treatment with it, the results aren't as good. So is that part of the training when you do that? Yeah, so the training was seven years ago in my memory. <laughs> so I'm sure that there were comments about it, but that, that doesn't mean that they... Um, no, I, th I think they highlight it, but again, for me, it's... it's um, we're not, the one thing I think that's great about methadone clinics, it's, it's all there, right? So for me, it's, it's just difficult to... 
uh, you're, you're not in my office, and I'm not in your office, and it would be nice if there was more coordination that we could um, say, walk down the hall here, and they'll you see your counselor, and that's a problem. Okay, Beth, anything else for you? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.